flavor. And now we will have uh, Jesse Martin, who will tell a little bit about how we can think in terms of graphs. So again, Jesse could not be here at the exact time. So we have a, a recording of his talk, but uh, um, uh, let's, let's have Jesse uh, coming and tell us about thinking in graphs. All right, and welcome to the Data Federation at the Data Layer talk here at API Days Interface. I am sorry that I'm actually not able to present this talk live this year. I am at this moment somewhere in the sky, hopefully still, and the API Days team was gracious enough to let me go ahead and submit a video and hopefully you'll enjoy it. You will be able to find me online on the interwebs uh, at places that I will mention later on if you have any questions and I'm happy to answer any and all of them. So a quick little mention about who am I? Uh, first of all, I've done a lot of stuff around the GraphQL space. Even with the API Days team, I've run some uh, GraphQL tracks in the past and I've been doing a lot of different GraphQL conferences. If you have GraphQL questions, I'm happy to answer those as well. And at the moment, I'm currently doing technical product marketing for Hazura Cloud. Hazura Cloud is really a fantastic way to take any production database and get an auto-generated GraphQL API right on top with a lot of pretty cool features that really make the whole data federation topic real uh, that we'll be covering at the end. Uh, beyond that, you can also find me, like I said, at uh, on the interwebs at Motley Dev. That is my Twitter handle. Uh, basically, anywhere you would want to find me, uh, Motley Dev is basically just me. So uh, I do a lot of things on there. Most of it is a, you can throw it away, but a couple of things I will promote uh, conferences and papers that I think are interesting. So if you want to find out more about what I find interesting, definitely find me there. Uh, before we go any further then, we're going to go into the actual meat of our talk. Today I'm going to be sort of splitting the talk into two halves. I'm going to try to go over roughly a 10 minute, what is data federation as a catch up survey. And this is not going to be an in-depth explaining all the features or the technical implications of that. It's going to be more of a getting everybody caught up to speed on the general topic. Uh, because I think there has actually been enough said about Data Federation as a whole, but I want to be able to show you potentially a new approach to Data Federation that I think is really going to help change the way you build applications. But to talk about what is Data Federation, we need to actually look at that. And to look at that, we need to say, what is Data Federation? And it is a big word for a very simple idea. And so that's specifically what I'm trying to say there is that this is not a uh, spec. A lot of people get confused there when we talk about data federation. They think this is some sort of formalized process that you need to have your UML charts to account for. Uh, it's not a specification and it's not a tech. It's not something specific for that. And this becomes a confusion in a lot of cases, especially even in GraphQL land, because some companies will actually say, uh, will call their technology that they use to implement data federation, data federation. And it's great naming. Uh, but other companies will use other terms to describe it. And so you see some confusion arrive in terms of, oh, well, uh, this isn't data federation because that thing over there is called data federation. Data federation is an idea, an idea that we want to look into in a little more depth. And I'm, and to do that, I've sort of given a, uh, a paragraph or a sent not a paragraph, but a sentence statement that I think encompasses what data federation is to me. Uh, and I think as I've talked to others in the industry as well, essentially what we're talking about is independent content sources that are accessible at a singular access point that are then presenting itself as a whole. And so what you get is a lot of times in any business organization, you've got a lot of these different floating pieces of data, data sources that you want to want to bring into the experience that you're delivering to customers uh, or stakeholders, or shareholders or whatever. You're wanting to be, be able to say all of these pieces are the ingredients that I want to I want to use to present this this final product and data and data federation is the idea of saying that's that's fine. These pieces can live independently, 
but we still want to bring them together in a unified access point. Now, if you'll give me a little bit of uh, forgiveness here for being a bit overly cute, a lot of times you'll end up with something like, you know, a CRM and a CMS and a CIM that are either owned by the CEO, the CFO, or even the CMO. And everything between PIM and DAM, you've got these different data sources, right? So, I mean, it, a, it's a little fun alphabet soup there, but the basic idea is, and, and you've all come across this, is that you do have all of these different data sources that have different data owners, and you don't wanna be shipping endless endpoints to your developers. So when we talk about this whole concept of all these different pieces, um, and we're saying that it's okay to leave them in place, that brings us to go ahead and ask the question, um, but why? <laughs> Which is a very helpful question to ask at this point because you have a lot of these different data sources that are already in place uh, and it's like, well, would we not be better off to just go ahead and bring them all into one, one structure? Well, no, and the first reason why not is that basically when we look at it, smaller autonomous data orgs work faster with better accuracy. And we see this time and time again, you have small business units inside of your company that are responsible for the integrity of their domain of data. And that data is, is fairly well encapsulated in, in terms of dependencies and interdependencies. And they are able to, con to deliver a really solid API uh, and, and they work well that way. And that's actually good. We want to take advantage of and leverage that, uh, that ability. So leaving them in place is good, but on the flip side of it, we see that distributing a single endpoint to all teams and API consumers is easier. Like a lot easier. <laughs> and if you've, if you've been in charge of API distributions and, and access management, you know what I'm talking about. It is a, a royal pain trying to actually work around all of these different uh, endpoints. If you're trying to orchestrate, you know, timing and interdependencies on the client or on some kind of a middle proxy, it, it falls apart. So the small orgs are good and the single API is good. And another reason why, you know, leaving things in place but delivering an a, a single API is sort of the solution here is that quite frankly, sometimes you don't have a choice. <laughs> you have to leave the data where it is. Uh, and, and that's born out of a lot of different reasons. A lot of, sometimes it's internal politics, you know, human factors, sometimes it's, it's other things. And those other things, you know, data itself is different type, you know, there are different structures of the data itself. The age of origin in your, your organization is different. So the data itself maybe was uh, at the beginning <laughs> of your business. Uh, you know, it came from a handwritten ledger at some point maybe. Uh, who knows? Like it, it could be that you have really old data in your system that just does not play well with others. Uh, the data itself has different purposes. You know, the, the workload type that you're trying to, to run with this data or the, or the data is being uh, accumulated from is actually maybe this one's time series and this is uh, hyper-relational and this one needs to be, uh, you know, very persistent or, or whatever else. The data itself, you know, it has different requirements in terms of storage and acquisition. Uh, and so the data itself tends to make description, make implications on on saying actually we're better off optimized living in this little you know circle and this bit of data is better off living in this little circle. So that is something that data itself uh, will will uh, say for itself that it needs to be uh, separate. So when we look at these different pieces, then we need to say, well, okay, obviously this is a problem that's been there for a while. Uh, what are some of the existing solutions to solve this problem? Um, and, and ultimately, what is it that I'm going to be presenting as a, a new opportunity into the mix? Uh, so existing solutions that are out there, you have things like API gateways probably the leader in solving this problem right now. And there are a number of players in this space that do a really good one, uh, really good jobs in this case. And API gateways solve many of the problems that actually arise. What API gateways don't solve in specific is that they do not solve the actual API structure, the end structure you're delivering to your customers. So you still have to do the API design step, which 
is you know, it's fine uh, and it's it's an important step, but you are not going to get away from the fact that you are essentially dealing with an API for APIs. And so while it does help to sort of build this, uh, you know, this ephemeral bubble around all of your APIs that then you have access controls and things of that nature, that's all good. You do still end up with a level up abstraction of your APIs. And so you're not getting the, the momentum as quickly that you would get if you're getting maybe something like a generated API from your data source. But again, there's risks there uh, and ones that we're trying to mitigate with a tool that I'll be mentioning. An alternative here as well um, that we see with API gateways, another big player in the space, or service messages, uh, meshes. Also a fine solution uh, in a lot of cases, kind of the idea that any entry node can uh, end up at another node. So you sort of have these breakout points or these these shared common interfaces between your services. So they're able to say, well, if I need this data from here, I can drill down to any part of this mesh and be able to access the interdependent data that I'm looking for. That's fine and that, that works well authorization becomes a nightmare in this context because you end up needing to really either say, I've written all my services from scratch. And so I know that the shared author authorization interfaces here between all my services, or you end up with potentially one service that kind of gets like forgotten <laughs> or neglected, uh, was purpose built and, and wasn't really updated when everything else was, uh, becomes you know an attack vector or, or other situations. So you have this problem where any of these individual service points become an, uh, essentially a, a also a potential point of failure. So it's also not the right right solution is having everything open. There's, there's benefits here to both approaches, but neither of them are really able to fully uh, accommodate the actual, the best solution, which is why what I, what Hazura is trying to do, um, and it's, this is not a, a Hazura only talk, it's more of a, an approach that I wanna discuss, what Hazura is doing is is putting the entry point at the actual data layer. So it's using the initial data layer itself as the point of federation uh, and an API design. And why that's really helpful, well, the first one is because you do get the API design built for you, generated. So I drop in a database, my tables, my relationships, everything else become auto-generated from the actual uh, inherit, inherited values of my database design. Production database, drop it in, I get this, this really cool API. So that's something that becomes really uh, uh, powerful to work with um, is that you get this, this entry point of, of your API design built right off the bat. Uh, and then you get the other thing is the, the integrated control plane. So you still get the API gateway like functionality of you know creating a single point of entry, authorization controls, uh, you know API limits, monitoring, logging, uh, all of these other things that you kind of would would need and which the API gateway solve nicely. But you get this as sort of a, as an enhancement on your existing database, which becomes your point of entry. And then you have these reach out points with the actual, uh, with this enhancement layer to start to federate out your other data sources. And so the benefit then here becomes ultimately is that with a, with a data layer based data federation, you're getting the best of both worlds. You're getting this sort of data graph, if you will, where you actually get the single point of entry, you get the data federation, you get the control access and everything else. Uh, and your API design comes along with it. So this is a, this is kind of the vision. Uh, that's where I'm going to stop the slides part, and we're going to switch to a demo. The demo we're we're going to be working with is uh, the U.S.'s Recreational Information Database. It's like all their kind of facilities and campsites and things like that. Not important, except the fact that it is a. <laughs> A messy data source that's full of legacy data and carryovers and, uh, and and old artifacts that just no longer mean anything to anybody, but they are still in the data source. So it's a really realistic database, a data set that was not even relational to begin with. It was you know triple format and it was now brought into uh, into a relational database for the purposes of this of this demo. Um, but what we're going to see is how you can take an existing data set like this 
get your generated API, which is great, and then actually enhance and annotate this with some additional data sources for the benefit of data federation that then presents itself as that singular API as a whole. Looks like I'm gonna have roughly five to six minutes for the demo part, so let's go ahead and hop into that right now. And here we are inside the demo. So uh, this is actually a quick uh, page that I've put together to outline the pieces. If you at me on Twitter later on, I'm happy to show you uh, the link to this repo. But basically, this is just from a previous workshop that I ran where we have uh, the different database URL connections and different pieces that you'll need to uh, replicate the same behavior at home if you would like to do something uh, similar. So we're gonna go ahead and start with our uh, Hazura project to go ahead and just get things initiated. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, kick this off here with just a simple, uh, I'm gonna go with actually the paid tier here. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and call this the interface demo. Uh, the reason I'm going with paid demos, I wanna show you a couple of interesting features if time allows at the end of the, uh, of the demo part and so we have this project getting, uh, getting bootstrapped here. Let's do a quick look again at what we're gonna be adding. In this case, what we're gonna be adding, and we're gonna only choose three of these services. We'll use the default database here for our connection. These are all read-only, so don't worry about <laughs> me exposing something. If you had a normal database, you would also get instant mutation APIs as well, which is amazing. Uh, we'll be adding in a CMS layer uh, provided by Graph CMS. Uh, and then we're gonna be adding a custom built weather API that's gonna allow us to be able to hook up this data uh, and get real time weather for a campground. So the story in our head here is that we have this uh, database. We're getting some guides that will be coming from our CMS to say, if you're hiking in bear country, what do you need to do uh, with, with uh, some helpful guides about bears? Uh, and then a weather API, uh, this campground has the projected forecast. That's our, our data story that we're wanting to create with three different pieces of data here. Again, all maintained by independent data teams. So let's go ahead and launch this project uh, from uh, Hazura here. And so now we are here inside of the console and we're able to get going. What I'm gonna do at the start here is go ahead and actually add my database, my primary database. You'll notice at the moment, uh, there's, there's nothing here inside of the project, no database is added. I could go ahead and make a new one if I wanted to, but I am going to simply grab the connection string for my primary database, my default database here. And I will just drop this inside uh, here. I'm gonna go ahead and call this my uh, primary or main and it's a Postgres database and I will just use the connection string to uh, go ahead and add this and I'll connect. So we're gonna give this couple of minutes here to go ahead and uh, do all of its uh, database connection things. And what it's doing is it's gonna go ahead and, and look at all the tables. It's gonna look at all the foreign key relations and it's going to go ahead and, and give me the opportunity to track those, uh, which is a really amazing concept. It's actually already added here. Let's go ahead and click on it. And you'll see that it sees all of my tables. I'm gonna go ahead and track all of them. That may not be what you wanna do, <laughs> uh, depending on your context, but I'm gonna go ahead and track all of those. Uh, and I'm gonna say fine. What it does is it goes ahead and it looks at all the foreign keys after that's been created. So we'll, we're tracking all those tables into their own top level API routes. This is the part where we're generating the GraphQL API based off of our, our actual real data set. And for the sake of time, I'm just doing a little bit of, uh, of cutting here. And we're gonna go ahead and track all of these uh, foreign key relationships. I'm gonna go ahead and track all of these. And we're gonna go ahead and do another fast forward. All right, and now essentially our API is, uh, is set up. We can go ahead and hop over to the API now. This is the Graphical Explorer. If you've worked with GraphQL before, you know what this looks like. I'm gonna go ahead and type in uh, campsites in this case. And we're just gonna just uh, kind of start to br uh, drill down a little bit, grab the uh, campsite name. And we'll go ahead and see that uh, our campsite is getting fetched from the database. So. And, and the problem I have here is that I forgot to put a limit on there. Uh, the reality is that uh, there's thousands and thousands and thousands of campsites in there. And I have zero limits set on my API at the moment. I'm gonna go ahead and put a quick limit on the API. Good, and so now I'm gonna go ahead and be able to uh, just limit that down to the first 10 requests so that we don't uh, just destroy everything. Now, inside of this, uh, one of the foreign key relationships that I have here is I have something called campsite attributes. 
and I'm going to go ahead and uh, and click on this here, and we're going to just draw, uh, drill down, and we're going to go ahead and grab. I think it's the uh, entity attribute name is what we want to do there. So I'm going to go ahead and use that and just show sort of what, what kind of gets resulted here from this relationship. What we see is we have you know, some at attributes, uh, campfire allowed, uh, check in time, check out time, things that are added to individual campsites. Now what I want to do is use this value here to connect to my CMS for uh, guides or articles that may help with some of these. And specifically, I have one in my CMS and that's for campfires allowed. Let's go ahead and add in a remote schema now. I'm gonna go back over to grab the API that I need from Graph CMS here. And I'm gonna hop back into Hazura and go to remote schemas. And I'm just gonna add a new one here at the top level. I'm gonna go ahead and call this the GCMS uh, schema. And I need to go ahead and grab my authentic, my token. This is a read-only token for a protection layer. You can do this all from environment variables for the sake of speed. I'm just doing it this way. I'm going to go ahead and add that remote schema. What we're going to get right off the bat is our connected uh, schema, which is great. So I'm going to head over now to the data again. And I'm going to drill into my uh, database. And on this campsite attributes, that's where I want to go ahead and create my first federated relationship. So I'm going to head to the relationships here. I'm going to go ahead and say add a remote schema relationship. We're going to go ahead and call this guides. I'm going to go ahead and use guides. I'm going to go ahead and connect this real fast so I don't bore you with the connection details and for the sake of time. And so what our joining relationship here is, is that on the guides, we are looking for the individual uh, model that I've called facility attributes um, and so looking for anything where the name of that facility attribute attached to a guide is matching them the attribute name from my own model and that's all we need to make that relationship work. We'll go ahead and hit save and our guides are created. So we'll go ahead and explore how that now works underneath the API. We'll go ahead and just run an exploration on that. So now what we should find is that we have a guides top level field and if we uh, drill down in there, we'll go ahead and get the actual title of that guide. Let's run that again. And if we look at the actual data that gets resulted, we can see now that even on our top campsite here, we have uh, the campsite campfires allowed. And then the first guide result we get is for fire smart. Cool. Everything's connected. We actually have our first two federated sources together. The next thing we want to go ahead and add is a relationship for our uh, weather API. We'll do that now. On this screen, I've simply done the same remote schema again, and this time, this time I've added the weather API. In this screen, I've gone ahead and added another weather remote schema uh, API, and I've added just the API for my weather GraphQL endpoint that is simply using the open weather database. That is now connected. I'm gonna go ahead and hop back over to the data to make a connection here. In this case, I'm gonna go ahead and add this directly to the campsites uh, field itself. And again, I will go ahead and define the relationships and we'll show you what I've done for the purpose of time. Okay, and so here what I've done is I've taken the single top level field that I have on my API, that's get weather, and I'm passing in the inputs, which is called cores. The lat value is coming from the campsite latitude value from my existing data set. The longitude uh, is also the same. We'll go ahead and hit save, and that's ready. Let's go ahead and test that inside of our API. We want to check for the weather and we're going to list out the next five days and get the description of the weather values. So when we run that query again, what we're getting is this complete federated story between the CMS and a, an additional uh, weather forecast. And that brings us all of this data together inside of a single API now where I'm able to actually access and control things. You'll notice that on my entirely unoptimized system, things take a little bit longer to uh, run to run this. I'm going to go ahead and make a new uh, test here where I'm going to go ahead and run this query uh, as a named operation. So we're going to call this simply the uh, get get 10. And when I run this, it's going to basically do the same thing. Uh, and after that's being run, I'm going to run this again with a uh, cache directive here. And this is the benefit of a benefit we see from having these uh, gateway behaviors layered on top. I'm going to run this again to cache the result initially. And it's again going to be roughly as long as, it, as it's been with our unoptimized system. But now when I run this again, you'll see that we get just lightning results. So here we have the actual overview console. And if we head down to the operations tab, 
we can see the results of that named operation being run. And we'll see that the first operation, the first one that we ran, uh, had an execution time of you know something unacceptable here. And then when we went ahead and cached it, we got a multiple X improvement on that execution time, uh, three milliseconds for the cache response. Now, I am literally way out of time now on this entire presentation, um, but this is the behavior that you would expect from API Gateway. You can add authorization rules as well. You can add a lot of features. I'd encourage you to have a look at Hazura. It's a great solution. But this idea of using a thin layer on top of your database to go ahead and generate the API, go ahead and get your, your access controls and your gateway-like behavior, but still be able to federate and, and the benefit of all these different services connected together becomes a really powerful primitive to just help your teams move faster. I am so out of time. I'm going to go ahead and call this right here, but uh, thank you for your time. And if you have any questions at all, uh, again, I'm not actually here live today, but if you have any questions at all, find me at Motley Dev online. I'm happy to answer any of your questions for you there. Thanks again and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you, Jesse. Uh, you're in the plane, but uh, we uh, we were able to learn from you about data for the federation.